I think that identifying leaders in movements that are driven by non-state actors is something that is challenging a lot of our diplomats and our foreign policy leadership right now. I think that the key is to not look for the proverbial Thomas Jefferson-like figure, the Vaclav Havel, the Nelson Mandela, the Lech Valenza. Don't look for that one individual who can organize and inspire the masses. Rather, I think that we have to recognize that as these movements become increasingly leaderless or with sort of more networked leaders, that we need to identify the 10, the 20, the 30 individuals with whom we can work rather than seeking to coordinate somebody or identify one, two, or three leaders who organize and inspire the masses from on high. So I think that it's going to change our interlocutors as diplomats, and we're going to have to look more for networks than for charismatic individuals. Yeah, I think the, the key here, first of all, is to not presume to pick a country's leaders for it. I think that there's a measure of humility that we need to have within our foreign policy. And so that's, that's really step one. Step two, I think, is listening. Uh, I, you know, I, that might sound obvious, but I, I tell our, our ambassadors, I say, remember, you only have one mouth, but you have two ears. So the second thing is to be a sophisticated observer of what's playing out in a given community. A lot of the time we see people parachuting in from the diaspora, presuming to become the leader, come to save people from a given country. And I think we need to be somewhat wary of that. I think we need to look for indigenous, organic leadership that has its roots of support from the ground up. And then I think that part of what we have to do is, is, is not come to dramatic conclusions too early in a process. I think we've learned from Iraq, I think we've learned from Afghanistan and, and elsewhere that countries that have come through conflict take a long time to transition. Similarly, I think that countries from throughout the Maghreb, and the Levant and elsewhere, who themselves are transitioning in different ways, I think this is going to be a years-long process. So I think we ought not be looking for that revolutionary figure who's going to run the country for the next decade or so. Rather, I think we need to have a measure of humility, we need to keep our ears open, and we need to not draw conclusions too early in what will be a years-long process. So I think the first thing in terms of balancing cybersecurity with online freedom is to never allow universal rights to be degraded. I do recognize that our, our networks are vulnerable. We are attacked, I'm speaking, the we, and this is the United States government, day in, day out. Tens of billions of dollars of economic value are stolen from our firms every year. Um, but we can't break the internet to secure it. Uh, I think that we need to First of all, tilt toward openness. The internet was built on an end user to end user principle without government intermediation. It was built to be open. And I think we need to do everything we can to preserve that openness. In terms of balancing the need for openness with surveillance, uh, I, I think that the fulcrum here is the rule of law. I think that rather than accepting a, perva a pervasive surveillance state, I think that there has to be rigorous due process before citizens are surveilled. I think that there has to be probable cause of the commission of a crime. And I think that to the extent that the fulcrum of the rule of law is less applicable in other countries where universal rights are not protected by the rule of law, then I think that it's very necessary for universal rights to take primacy. I think the United States has done a job that's essentially second to none in terms of advocating for an open internet. And our practice follows our policy here. Of course we have capabilities to intercept communications. You know, this is something that we are very open about. But the key is that it follows due process and the rule of law. We do not live in a country that has pervasive surveillance on demand all the time of its citizens. And I think that countries around the world can look to us as an example. Yes, there are reasonable measures that need to be taken by, that can and should be taken by law enforcement to keep the public safe. 
but it has to follow due process. You cannot compromise universal rights. And I think that this can be a North Star for other countries seeking to achieve balance within their society as well. You know, I, I don't know whether citizen journalists help or hinder American soft power. What I do think is that they, are, they do strengthen journalism. Um, I think that if you look at Tunisia, I think that if you look at Syria and Egypt and elsewhere, I think that the evidence is clear that the, that the public good has been very well served by people being able to document and disseminate what is happening in environments that historically were more closed information environments. Um, I think that the United States has been pretty good at communicating with citizen journalists to help debunk myths about what our intentions are in a given country and what have you. But in terms of our soft power, I don't know that I necessarily conflate American soft power with the activities of citizen journalists. So more important than American diplomats getting their message out is for American diplomats to listen. So I tell our diplomats, remember you only have one mouth, but you have two ears. Uh, so the first utility in my, in, to my thinking in a world that's increasingly networked and increasingly digital is this is a way for us to be able to learn, to be able to get information from non-traditional interlocutors from people other than the generals, the CEOs, and the government ministers that we typically deal with. So that's principle one. Principle two is, in terms of getting our message out, I actually am not a big believer in old school propaganda through social media. You know, at a time where people got all their news from the one newspaper they read in the morning and the one state-controlled broadcast they watched at night, maybe propaganda would have been more effective. But I am very, very skeptical about how effective it's going to be in a world in which people get their information from dozens, if not a hundred or more sources. In that environment, where I think we're better suited, where I think American diplomats are better suited, is by focusing on discussion and by sharing facts, rather than by pushing a message out and trying to shove it down people's throats, because I just don't think it's going to work. I think social media platforms, the internet generally, lends itself well to discussion. Um, but it's not a discussion that the United States can control. We can help initiate discussions. Today, you know, we had a Twitter Q&A with our ambassador to NATO, Evo Dalder. Now, the ambassador to NATO, just saying that, ambassador to NATO, it sounds inaccessible. It sounds like you are behind high gates. But we're trying to make these people accessible. Um, but in making them accessible, you can't control the conversations. You can't make sure, you can't ensure that they're going to be polite. You can't ensure that, you know, people are going to restrain themselves in their engagements with you. And I think this is a good thing. I think that the loss of control is not necessarily a net negative for the United States. Uh, I think to the extent that we're having open, honest engagement with citizens from the, around the world, that's all for the better. Yeah, I don't think that traditional diplomacy needs to be changed at all. I actually think that the statecraft which has been practiced and honed since Benjamin Franklin was our first diplomat in the 1770s to present day, I think that that is as necessary as ever. Rather, I think that living in a world of increasingly powerful and ubiquitous information networks means that we need to adapt our statecraft somewhat. We need to account for the way that people consume and produce information differently today than even 10 years ago. But the old statecraft, the skills that you need um, to move people toward consensus, to advance America's interests, are largely unchanged. The United States has had a great many diplomatic leaders over the last 250 years, and I think the skills that helped us in the 1700s and the 1800s, many of those same skills apply in 2012 and beyond. You know, the, an example that I can think of that comes immediately to mind in terms of distributed power, distributed public leadership in the United States, comes with a recent uh, congressional debate over two pieces of online, uh, two pieces of proposed online piracy legislation, SOPA and PIPA. I think that what was notable about that is that would have tr what would have traditionally been a, wa a traditional Washington struggle, binary, Hollywood and the content 
providers having one point of view, uh, Northern California and the internet companies having another point of view. That old binary construct um, was broken somewhat by citizens who engaged in the debate uh, with ferocity and at great scale, at truly grand scale. So when I think and when I talk about power moving from hierarchies to citizens and networks of citizens, I'm not talking about this in the context of just China or just the Middle East. I think that this is something that is impacting every connected society, including the United States. And I think we've seen it very recently uh, with the impact that everyday American citizens had on the discussion about this online piracy legislation in the United States. So I think it's chapter one, page one, in terms of seeing these citizen-centered networks uh, taking root and exercising power in the United States, but I think it's inevitable that they will continue to exercise power and that their influence will grow. I think that being a nonprofit leader, you have to get out of your comfort zone more often than not. You know, when I was an inner city school teacher working for Teach for America and then as a social entrepreneur, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create solutions in environments that previously didn't have them. You know, you are working in an environment of market failure, so to speak. And similarly with diplomats, you've got to be comfortable working in really difficult environments, talking to people who you would not necessarily um, choose to spend time with, who you didn't necessarily, kinds of folks you didn't necessarily grow up with. So you're by your very nature outside of your comfort zone, trying to create solutions with and for people um, that hadn't been there previously. So I think you need to be entrepreneurial. I think you need to be flexible. I think you need to be respectful. And I think that these are commonly shared traits between social entrepreneurs working in the not-for-profit not sector and diplomats uh, working in any of the 194 countries around the world where we work. Yes, I think at the end of the day, credibility online matches credibility offline more often than not. We cannot say one thing on the internet and then do something else as a matter of our foreign policy. I think that the distinction between the online and the offline world is increasingly a distinction without meaning. Now, one way to build credibility online is to make connections with people around the world who are, for example, non-elites. So one of the things that I try to coach our ambassadors to do is to move beyond the generals, the CEOs, and the government ministers that they're comfortable interacting with and open themselves up. So for example, two weeks ago, I did uh, something online, something streamed on the internet where I worked with more than, a, where I took questions from more than 100 journalists from about 25 countries. Uh, that would have been a massive production that would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars using broadcast technology. But because of digital technology and because of, frankly, the internet, uh, I was able to have this open discussion with journalists from every nook and cranny from around the world, from the Republic of Georgia to Guyana to, to, to El Salvador and beyond. And so another way of establishing credibility is to open yourself up to make yourself accessible and to make yourself accessible to people with whom you wouldn't ordinarily be interacting. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of the time people have questions when, it's, when there are American diplomats using American platforms. And goodness knows, every time somebody talks about Google, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Facebook, Twitter, you know, it's going to get press, it's going to get attention, and oftentimes abroad people are going to question whether these are, American, these are American platforms being used to advance America's interests. And so from my standpoint, it's all the better if we can use local, locally owned, locally operated social media platforms to connect and engage with local populations. In Japan, let's use Mixi, in Jordan, let's use Maktoub, and Russia, let's use Vankantia. So I, I, I really believe it's important to, to use the platforms and the tools that match the local information environment, not to just try to push American tools or to only utilize American tools and platforms.
I think that identifying leaders in movements that are driven by non-state actors is something that is challenging a lot of our diplomats and our foreign policy leadership right now. I think that the key is to not look for the, rather than seeking to coordinate somebody or identify one, two, or three leaders who organize and inspire the masses from on high. So I think that it's going to change our interlocutors as diplomats and we're going to have to look more for networks than for charismatic individuals. Yeah, I, I think the, the key here, first of all, is to not presume to pick a country's leaders for it. I think that there's a measure of humility that we need to have within our foreign policy. And so that's, that's really step one. Step two, I think, is listening. Uh, I, you know, I, that might sound obvious, but I, I tell our our ambassadors, I say, remember you only have one mouth, but you have two ears. So the second thing is to be a sophisticated, observer, proverbial Thomas Jefferson-like figure, the Vaclav Havel, the Nelson Mandela, the Lech Valenza. Don't look for that one individual who can organize and inspire the masses. Rather, I think that we have to recognize that as these movements become increasingly leaderless, or with sort of more networked leaders, that we need to identify the 10 the 20, the 30 individuals with whom we can work over of what's playing out in a given community. A lot of the time we see people parachuting in from the diaspora, presuming to become the leader, come to save people from a given country. And I think we need to be somewhat wary of that. I think we need to look for indigenous, organic leadership that has its roots of support from the ground up. And then I think that part of what we have to do is